Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the topic of opening to intuition. With me is Linda Tellington Jones, the author of The Tellington Tea Touch. Linda is known throughout the world for her work with animals and her pioneering development of the Tellington Tea Touch method. She is the founder and president of the Tellington Tea Touch organization. There are now 2,500 people trained in her methodology working on every continent except South Antarctica, I, I suppose, right. all over the world. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. It is a real pleasure for me to be with you. It is a pleasure to be with you. And in our earlier discussions, it seems as if we have uh, been traveling in some of the same circles for many, many years. And for all I know, we bumped into each other several times without realizing it. We must have crossed in the hallway. <laughs> it, it would seem as yeah, if. I think so. We may have even shared the same room as an office. At one yes. Time. yes, isn't that fascinating? <laughs> In San Francisco, uh, yeah. most amazing. So mm -hmm. you uh, have been on quite a journey. In, in your lifetime, and you've been a, a student of various uh, wisdom teachers and yes. teachers of intuition for many decades, and, and that's really what led you to develop your own pioneering work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was um, actually where my spiritual path and my whole concept of intuition began was 1972 at Esalen Institute when Robert Monroe from the Monroe Institute was giving a weekend uh, workshop, an invitational workshop yeah. for 40 people, and Russell Tark was there actually measuring all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, when, he, I, when he looked at my results mm -hmm. and said to me, um, that I had as close to a 50-50 use of logic and intuition, left and right hemispheres, mm -hmm. I was totally surprised because I never thought of myself as logical. And so I thought, okay, I'm basically a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how, how, can, how do we develop this left and right hemisphere, this intuition and logic? And so into my hands somehow came this amazing book, Drawing from the Right Side of the Brain yes. from Betty Edwards, classic mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. And I started practicing, you know, for months in my mind, drawing my name backwards, writing words backwards with the right hand, with the left hand, doing all of these exercises. And what's really interesting, Jeffrey, is that I didn't realize the role that um, Robert Monroe had played because until I actually was um, answering questions for a book that just came out two days ago about me. It's called Linda, Trust Your Intuition. Uh -huh. And um, I didn't realize until I started thinking, okay, what started me on this spiritual path that it was, I didn't even really know what the Monroe Institute did because yeah. I'd never looked at their website. Mm -hmm. And that whole thing of you know intuition and all that the amazing uh -huh. Monroe Institute teaches that's been a basis for that yeah. and, and for those words from Russell Tark all mm -hmm. these years. Well, of course, Robert Monroe is famous for his out-of-body experiences, journeys out of the body, far journeys. and Way up there. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm assuming that's what this Esalen workshop was about. That's what it was, and we did this hemisync, mm -hmm. and as it happened, as we were sharing after among the 40 people, um, uh, uh, um, Joan Halifax mm -hmm. wa and I had the same vision. We connected to the same cry of an eagle, and so we started talking about it after, mm -hmm. and she asked me if I would um, go and, um, and help uh, Christine Groff, mm -hmm. because her cat was having kittens and the cat was going crazy and she'd never seen this before and would I come and help and that's how I met Joan and mm -hmm. I've had many, many years of contact with her since. Right? So this is 1972 72. and you were already at this point well known for your work with animals, I must assume. 
um, 72. Well, no, at that point, I mean, I'd had a school mm -hmm. for, I was known in the horse world, mm -hmm. and I had a school for, ri a residential school for riding instructors and trainers at the Pacific Coast Equestrian Research Farm and mm -hmm. School of Horsemanship. Yes. And people came to us from nine countries and mm -hmm. 36 states and spent these nine months with us. But I was, I never had the time to be on a spiritual path at mm -hmm. that point. I mean, for me, um, I had gone to church. I was raised by parents who only knew and recognized a loving God. Mm -hmm. And they actually, um, they really lived the golden rule. Mm -hmm. They were role models for me mm -hmm. for prejudice was never allowed in our home. Uh -huh. And I was born in Edmonton, Alberta. And at that time, there was a lot of prejudice mm -hmm. against the people who were, who were emigrating mm -hmm. from Russia and, of course, you know, Indians, Yes. Uh, but not in our home. I see. Well, that's wonderful. And also, I gather about your childhood that you, you and all of your siblings were into horses. Well, yes. <laughs> in fact, in I fact had <laughs> competed. Well, yes, and the thing is that um, <clears throat> I had to ride to school for the first six years of my life in rural Alberta. Uh -huh. Poor kid, right? <laughs> and our horses stayed in a stable. My horse stayed in a stable. There were only maybe five or six of us rode. All the rest of the kids had to ride. Mm -hmm. I mean, to walk to, to school. Walk. To walk to <laughs> you school. You got to ride. I got to ride a, a with horse my to school. That's right. My yes. gosh. So, for you, being around animals was was something that. Uh, was part of your life from virtually the beginning. It was. And um, my grandmother, for instance, would say, don't ever kill a spider. What about its family? <laughs> and I remember my, my, my father's mother, because at one point we lived on the farm with him when my father was helping mm -hmm. um, dur my grandfather during the war yes. on a pig and wheat farm. And I remember my grandmother bringing uh, like runts into the kitchen and mm -hmm. instead of just letting them die, warming them up, keeping them warm until they were strong enough to go back. Uh -huh. And I remember my grandfather found um, a nest of rabbits and he brought a little bunny in and that rabbit would go up the stairs and rustle around in his beard and wake him <laughs> up in the morning. And I think the most unusual was my dad mm -hmm. who um, had uh, bought, had uh, disturbed a nest of duck eggs. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when he was cutting hay, oh, yeah. and he brought the eggs home, and we had a cat who had kittens in the kitchen at mm -hmm. that point. Her kittens were in a basket, I remember, in uh -huh. our kitchen. And he put the eggs with this mother cat and the kittens, and several of those chicks, or actually ducks, little ducks, actually hatched and um, grew up. Were raised by the cat? By the cat. <laughs> How and, amazing. So you were exposed to interspecies communication. From the and, very beginning. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's an unusual childhood, certainly compared to mine. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and and it's also unusual that my my parents really honored animals. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just something, you know, that we used. It was mm -hmm. a great honoring, mm -hmm. a real blessing for me. Now, you mentioned Russell Targ, uh, 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 who pointed out to you that your left brain and your right brain functions were balanced, which is, I, I think uh, most people in psychology would say that is a good, strong sign of a highly intuitive person. Oh, interesting. I, I would think so, because it means the two hemispheres of your brain can communicate with each right, other. exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's what Tellington T-Touch is all about, actually. Is it, uh, explain that. Well, um, actually, I would really love to tell you how I first became interested in the word intuition. Okay. Because it is as much a part of my journey as that one meeting with Russell Targ mm -hmm. and Robert Monroe. Mm -hmm. But for my 30th birthday, I saw an ad in the San Francisco Chronicle that um, said, um, for five dollars, you can get a you can get your an astrological chart that is produced by the first um, uh, computer. Oh yes, and it was in Stanford basement, Stanford mm -hmm. University I basement. I recall you uh, wrote to me about this and the <laughs> reading you got is just uncanny. Well, what it said, and I still have this little booklet, mm -hmm. it's tied with the ribbon actually as it came, um, 
it said that in my lifetime, I would develop a form of communication that would spread around the world. And in order to do so, I had to learn to trust my intuition. Mm -hmm. And I, okay, I went to our library in the living room, and my husband was 20 years older than I. I I wouldn't be here if I hadn't had that Mm -hmm. amazing experience with Wentworth Tellington. And he had a big library, and he was at that time a a study, he he, a follower of Rosicrucian studies. Uh And I pulled down one of the Rosicrucian books and opened it to intuition, and it described intuition as unlearned knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I see that today as knowledge in the quantum field. Mm -hmm. And actually, in um, Greg Braden's book, um, what I want to, I want the sentence from the book, actually, it's the spontaneous healing of belief. Mm -hmm. He writes that every thought, every feeling, every emotion, and every belief that each one of us has affects the whole quantum field. Uh And that's, you know, that's how I see the whole concept of the Akashic Records. There, Every thought that's ever been thought is here. Mm-hmm. And every thought that we as human beings have, or every belief, every feeling, every mm-hmm. emotion, affects that field. Nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. and But for me, that is the best news that one could have, because that means that when we take care of our thoughts and choose mm-hmm. to think, choose the positive thoughts mm-hmm. or choose to see that half empty glass is half full each one of us does make a difference and mm-hmm. that's that's what keeps me going in the current world we're mm-hmm. in well that's pretty much why i do these interviews as as well as to spread as many positive deep yes. thoughts as as i can as widely as possible into the world And I love your interviews. When I looked down at that list of interviews yesterday preparing for this, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to take the time to listen to all of them because they're (laughs) really, really precious. Well, I I, thank you for for that. At this point, there are so many, it would take more than 100 hours. I can tell. It's not... (laughs) <laughs> but you do, you do extensive training with people to learn the uh, Tellington T Touch uh, process. It's, uh, if, if I recall, three years of of training. Is that right? Yes. Uh huh. In the, in um, in Europe, it's two years. In this country, it's three. And you do like depending two or three week long six day trainings, mm-hmm. and you have to accumulate. It's for companion animals, but primarily the work is with dogs Mm -hmm. and with horses. We Mm -hmm. still have a lot of kitty people who make a difference with their cats in one T-Touch session. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it. So on the one hand, a person in one session can make an enormous difference in how they interact with uh, their companion animal. And on the other hand, to really master the process could take three years. Yes, and the fact is, just from reading the book, we've had many, many people, one of my 21 books, yeah. people can make a difference with the, their own animals or themselves. Mm-hmm. Because thanks to the work with the animals, we've developed what we call the magic three tea touches mm-hmm. that you can use for yourself to reduce stress, or if you're in a situation that's a shocking experience, like the fires that are going on right now in California. Oh, yes. I'm, I'd like to, sh- well, actually, you know what? I'd like to just show you. Okay. Because we have so many people who are in situations where they feel helpless, mm-hmm. or where they have shocking news, or something happens, an yeah. accident, whatever. And what we have hundreds and hundreds of cases of this because in our human three-year trainings you you have to write all these cases so we find you put like your thumb behind your ear Mm -hmm. take the forefinger and just do a slide up Mm -hmm. then go in this little valley of the ear right down in the lower that's where the trigeminal nerve comes in and Uh go slide upward Uh go a little higher slide up and go to the top my. And your thumb is behind, and your thumb uh-huh. gets a trigeminal nerve. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you are, we never understood all these years why four times can bring a person out of shock or keep them out of shock. My. Or, yeah, and you just, mm-hmm. or if you're tired or mm-hmm. cold or just, you know, you, you feel you've got to go on, but you need more energy, uh-huh. you do this to yourself. 
How interesting, because I, as I recall, in, in some uh, fields of holistic medicine, they, they say there are nerves that connect the ear to every other part of the body. Every, there, there are, you know, there, there are whole systems that just yeah. work on the ear to affect mm -hmm. the whole body, but you can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about T-Touch. It's for self-help, self-empowerment mm -hmm. for you or your animals. That is so simple and so profound and it's and so ignored by most people, I would think. It's just right there. It is right here. Yeah. And the hardest thing is for me is always to learn to do it gently because you uh -huh. know, there's a tendency when I start, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the cases um, you know, I worked on a on a man in this is like the late eighties. Mm -hmm. I was at a big horse expo in Germany, mm -hmm. and it w we were all packing up, and a physical therapist who was in my training came running over and said, Linda, you've got to come here. This guy has collapsed. He doesn't look good, and everybody's just standing around waiting mm -hmm. for the paramedics. Mm -hmm. So I go over there. His tongue is out. His eyes are rolled back. He is green. He is not a good color, and you could see no breath. Mm -hmm. So I just kneeled down mm -hmm. behind him and started working his ears mm -hmm. and talking to him in German and saying, stay with us, you're going to be okay, you mm -hmm. know, in this voice, just stay with us. Yeah. And um, it wasn't, it was less than a minute, and <gasps> I mean, he took this huge breath, uh -huh. and his tongue went in, his eyes came down, he, he was present. Uh -huh. So the paramedics came within minutes. Mm -hmm. And so I stepped back, and they, he's obviously breathing, so they're not, um, bothering, you know, they're not worried about him. Mm -hmm. And I, I was watching him and he, his eyes started to go back again. Oh. So I just kneeled down and started this again while they're getting all their stuff out. and On his ears again. Yeah, on uh -huh. his ears. And um, so I got, I received a fax, those are the days of the faxes, three days later saying that he'd had a massive heart attack and he lived. And he lived another year and a half. Uh -huh. um, the poignant story about this was especially important for me because I was a citizen diplomat in the former mm -hmm. Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Was there ten times, mm -hmm. and um, he had been a German prisoner who'd been in Siberia for ten years, and then oh. had come out, out and was working mm -hmm. in, um, you know, in in Russia in the yeah. former Soviet Union. And he had come across the the wall was down at that point, and now he was teaching riding in Germany, mm -hmm. and so. It was a special connection, you mm -hmm. know? but the fact is, we know from the ear work that you can actually bring a person out of shock or keep them out of shock, and in cases we know of, you can actually have an effect on their heart if mm -hmm. you don't know what else to do. Most amazing. You are full of practical tips, aren't you? It's, this is about self-help. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, we need we need ways to empower ourselves mm -hmm. and to appreciate this brilliance, brilliant healing potential in our own self. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's my passion. That's well, my passion. I recall one of my mentors, Gene Houston, yes. saying, uh, we, referring to the human being, but I'm sure it's true of almost any animal, we are born with uh, a, a Stradivarius violin, but we don't learn to play it properly. We play it like it was a plastic fiddle. And how. Mm -hmm. And you know, Gene Houston, um, when I first started developing the work, and we have, like, the Tellington Tea Touch is made up of the body work mm -hmm. that we call Tea Touch. Yes. Which, the t second T in Tea Touch stands for trust. Uh -huh. And then there's the, uh, the ground exercises that we do, mm -hmm. and then there's all the equipment that we use, these special harnesses and everything that we have for dogs, yes. and for horses, all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and two important factors. One is what we think, because the intention we hold for that behavior, or health, or performance, or relationship <clears throat> with that animal mm -hmm. is what is going to actually affect them. So we have to hold the picture of the behavior, performance, health, yeah. or relationship we want because our human tendency is, oh, well, that's just the way the animal is, right? Mm -hmm. Or that's just the way I am. I'm always whatever. Uh, my, one of my favorite important textbooks is uh, Lynn McTaggart's The Intention Experiment. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody listening to this, if mm -hmm. If they do not know that book, mm -hmm. 
treat yourself and get that book yes. because you will be able to it, change it's your a life. significant book now i recall in your book an interesting story that i think illustrates this point you're making about holding intention and yes. it, it's about uh, a situation in which you were working on some uh, young snow leopards, a, a single, they were all sick, and but you dealt with one of the uh, siblings. That's right. Uh-huh. Yes. There were actually, this was at the Zurich Zoo, mm -hmm. and I was there giving a presentation that evening to veterinary students at the, at the vet school, the Zurich Mm -hmm. University vet school. And the head veterinarian for the Zurich Zoo has been a friend of mine since he graduated from vet school. He's now retired. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And um, so they had this, there were two, a pair of snow leopards, and they were about nine months old. Yeah. So, and they were dying of an undiagnosable respiratory disease. Mm -hmm. And they could, they were certain, Avald was certain they weren't going to save them. Yeah, so, Avald being the... Avald Eastenbugel was a head vet. Yes, yes. Professor Dr. Mm -hmm. Avald Eastenbugel. Who wrote, as I recall, the introduction to your book. That's right, book. he, he mm -hmm. did, yes. Yeah. And um, he was just at my 80th birthday party in Germany on the 9th of September. So oh. Was. So anyway, um, they brought out this snow leopard and gave me five minutes because they were afraid it would be really upset and get yeah. more stressed. So just put, I sat down in a chair in the back, you know, part of the zoo, and the other snow leopard was about Mm, you know, maybe 12 feet away. Mm -hmm. We were just on the edge of the enclosure. Yeah. So it put it down here, and this snow leopard, with every breath, with was bloody mucus was bubbling out of the nostrils. Oh. And so I just intuitively mm -hmm. began doing these tiny, tiny, moving the skin like around the nostrils in mm -hmm. one and a quarter circles. I'll, we'll talk about why after this basic one and a quarter circle, which is actually a spiral. Uh -huh. That's really the secret, I think, behind this. Uh -huh. And I, I just, with no intention except to support the brilliance of our body's mm -hmm. potential for ideal function. Mm -hmm. And I started there with n never, oh, poor thing, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. Actually, with what I call an empty gourd head, which I'll tell you after how I learned yeah. that one. And so I just started with these tiny, tiny, what we call raccoon circles, mm -hmm. just very close together. And I started down, you know, the nostrils up over the head and down the neck and along the spine, just paying attention to my breathing and just holding this feel. Just, it's just like, know your perfection for ideal functioning. That's now, our method. If, if I can interrupt a second, a snow leopard, even at just nine months old, they are very powerful animals, aren't they? They are. But, you know, they, Aval Dysenbuchel, Dr. Dysenbuchel had, they, he always were, had this feeling with the animals of making a special connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is really, he was really, and I have a picture of him after with that snow leopard coming up to the fence after that one time and leaning in, and she's kind of going, eh, like, and he's injecting, uh -huh. giving her an injection, and yeah. she's allowing this because of his connection with her. Oh, oh. Now, and, and the animal was not, anesthetized? No, no, no. So just in time for your injection. Yeah. And when you were working with the snow leopard, you, you didn't had... didn't move. It didn't move. You had no fear, I guess. No. I mean, no. Okay. I mean, wh why, why... Well, the, he had I? claws and teeth and... You know, animals know when we're going to help them? That's mm -hmm. a really good question, Jeffrey. And we found often, like with this ear work that we do mm -hmm. with all animals, um, if they're sick, they may allow you to do things that they would never allow if mm -hmm. they didn't need the help. Uh -huh. They and they know okay. the core level. So anyway, and I you work, knew that they knew. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And you know, people say to me, okay, Linda, how is it that you work with so many different species. I've worked around the uh, around the world in zoos. Yeah. But wait, 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 wait. Yeah, so because I want to come back to okay. the uh, thought, the mental intention that you were holding when you Remember were... Remember your perfection. Yeah. And that I'm just talking to the cells. I'm just holding this 
potential for ideal function. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to heal. I am not a healer. No. And I don't want to do anything that anybody else can't do. Mm -hmm. Just hold the perfection. Yeah. And hold this feeling of wonder. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. Wow. We are miracles. Every cell in our body mm -hmm. is actually a divine spark. Now, as I recall, though, in your book, yes. you wrote that you also, and you said you didn't tell anybody at the time, you were holding the intention that this healing would affect not only this baby snow leopard, but also its siblings who were also sick. The one right there. There yeah. was one sibling. Uh -huh. Absolutely. I was holding the intention that, the, and, and, and she was watching us, mm -hmm. really intently watching what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So I was just projecting that she could feel this mm -hmm. also. Okay. So it, who you never touched? No, I never got near, actually. Yeah. Uh -huh. Never even talked to her. Okay. And then? And then? And the tail was that long. The tail was almost on the floor down here. And I went to the very tip of the tail. They had given me five minutes, but it actually it was 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I, when I got to the tip of the tail, and Avalt and the other zookeeper, they did not move while I was doing it. It was just like time had stopped. Everybody was in a but trance state. They were really And you, there. you were too, I presume. I, I, I was completely focused on the potential. Uh huh. Potential. Well, I I would you know only in a few times in my life have I been around exotic animals like that. But it's awesome, and every time I'm near them, I I feel yeah. like it puts me into an altered state. Interesting. Yes, they have such such a special role. Anyway, so mm -hmm. what happened? The zookeeper picked up the leopard, put the snow leopard back in. And an hour later, their temperatures were checked. Mm -hmm. And remember, mm -hmm. they'd been handled all the time. So, I mean, these were not wild animals. Right. They're handled. They're in a zoo. Right. And, and in a zoo that handled the animals mm -hmm. at that time. So, um, and the temperature was normal. Mm -hmm. And that's what Dr. Eastenbugel writes in the introduction to my book. It was what happened, mm -hmm. right? And including the sibling. Including the sibling. Not just the one I were. Both. Mm -hmm had temperatures. So you're holding normal. the mental intention to heal or, or to be a, a catalyst for both animals seemed to make a difference. Well, no question. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took the... And, and, and for me, again, I really want to emphasize there is something um, really magical that happens with this one and a quarter circle. It's not just petting or massaging or stroking. Mm -hmm. And actually, we've done studies with uh, Anna Wise from the Boulder Institute of Biofeedback, and she worked with Maxwell Cade, who developed this mind mirror to yes. measure con states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So we've worked with Anna actually four times. Mm -hmm. And um, I also had the great fortune to work with Dr. Fritz Albert Popp mm -hmm. um, in his International Institute of Biophysics in Neuss, Germany. Mm -hmm. And that's when we found out that the one and a quarter circle, moving the skin, it yeah. does not work if you just do a circle over the skin. You have to catch the skin and move the tissue. Mm. Uh, and one circle and a little more. If you do like two circles, like mm -hmm. nah, 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 it's not the same because we're not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We're not present. If I just kind of, nah, 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 it's uh -huh. not acupuncture, it's not mm -hmm. acupressure. Yeah. It's staying present mm -hmm. in this. And that is a huge gift. Yeah. So, I, we know. So what happened with the POP Institute, we did first a pilot study, yeah. to, and we found that indeed that the one and a quarter circles moving the skin did activate the, the cell function more than the required 17% to make it effective. Mm. No. Well, I like your emphasis on the notion of being present. That's it. Be because it seems that uh, that makes all the difference between mechanically going through some sort of a recipe yep. as, as opposed to the application of conscious intuition. Exactly. And you know, it's like playing the piano. You learn the scales. You learn the different touches and the different parts of your hand that you can use. 
and then you allow just to see what works at that what mm -hmm. effects and you know you mentioned Gene Houston yes. when I was I first developed these uh, different touches yes. we had one two three four and five ways of holding the hands mm -hmm. and then I realized oh dear who can remember those like numbers yeah. and so we named it the first one was the clouded leopard mm -hmm. where you hold your hand like a big paw and you the pads of your fingers move the skin mm -hmm. in one and a quarter circles. Mm -hmm. And that brings the most awareness. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we had the raccoon touch, which is the tip of the fingers. That's what I did on that little snow leopard, like around the, uh -huh. these parts. And, and you intuitively knew what to do. I just allowed my fingers to do Your whatever fingers knew fit. What to, you be, know, because, because you have a repertoire of, I'm guessing, maybe 50 different... Of the scales. We have 20, about 20, 22 now. 22 different right? ways of touching... Parts of the hand. Uh -huh. Parts of the hand that yeah. you actually move. Uh -huh. And one of the mm -hmm. reasons that this Tellington T-Touch training system works so is we have also um, pressures from 1 to 10 and tempo, like that's a one second circle, a two second circle, and a three second circle. The time it takes you to move the skin around the face of the clock. And you can learn this, you can learn it in a couple of days mm -hmm. just to affect it. We, we did um, actually on YouTube, there is a uh, little video of me working on a woman with Alzheimer's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. In a in a um, senior center in Ohio, mm -hmm. and we had I had been invited there to give a two day trainings to um, half the staff, twenty four one day and twenty five the next day. So mm -hmm. it was a four days, and then because the state was paying for that study and paying everybody's salaries to be there out mm -hmm. of their work, um, they <coughs> had to do a one year. Um, recording of every time the T-Touch was used oh. for, you know, somebody who was crying and wouldn't go to sleep or wouldn't take their meditation or was wandering mm -hmm. or wanted to go home mm -hmm. or was having a lot of These are all Alzheimer's patients. These were dementia and Alzheimer's, uh -huh. right. Yeah. And, um, and so, and it's fascinating that all of those, so they didn't want just the caregivers, they wanted the kitchen help, everybody for some reason, to mm -hmm. be able to do this. Well, that makes sense. And it's an amazing study how less than five minutes mm -hmm. of whoever was feeding them or taking care of them could take put that person to a place of peace. You know... Just with a couple of these little touches. You're reminding me of an experience I had in 1969 I fresh out of college, I, I worked at a mental health clinic, mm. and uh, Ber Bernie Gunther, who was an Esalen mm, yeah. teacher, wrote a book about uh, touch and sensation. I don't know that one. Is he still alive? I don't know. Oh, I'd love to contact so, him. But I was reading it, and I was dealing with, I was in a, a, a clinical setting with a woman who hadn't spoken in since she'd been there. I don't know. She just didn't talk. And we yeah. did this simple little thing. I intuitively thought, let's just uh, had each of them do this to Beautiful. themselves, just little tapping yeah. like this on the scalp. This woman started talking. Beautiful. After that. Beautiful. The simplest, eh? Yeah. That's the thing that gets me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to mention Gene Houston. I started yeah. to talk as we develop these different hands, like that's the that's the clouded leopard. The yeah. raccoon touch is the very tips of the fingers. Mm -hmm. The lying leopard, when you, the, I imagine the, this little leopard stretching out the front legs and sitting down like this, that's the lying leopard. Mm -hmm. And then you get the tag, the, the uh, bear touch, which is with the fingernails. Mm -hmm. You go, might go in with the fingernails. Some uh -huh. people and animals love that. Uh -huh. Kitties love it when you do it very lightly just in front of the tail and they'll be like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sticking the tail up. And, uh -huh. and then, so then you, that's with the nails. Mm -hmm. And you have to have nails to do it because it's just, it's very lightly. Uh -huh. And then the tiger touch, ha, you know, with uh -huh. the fingernails farther apart. Uh -huh. And then you 
move the finger, tip the fingers over, yeah. and that back of the fingernails, which mm -hmm. we sometimes use just like that oh. in different ways. This mm -hmm. is really nice around your own neck, you know, to do this. Mm. And that is the baby chimp because I've worked on chimps. Mm -hmm. And you know how chimps curl their fingers up when they walk. Well, yes, yes. And then there's the baby orang, because mm -hmm. I worked on a little two-month-old orangutan in the San Diego Zoo who wa had an inadequate sucking reflex. Mm. And you know how orangs, they let their fingers hang more. So uh -huh. orang is from the tip to the second joint. And you don't need to remember these names, but it's just kind of fun. And what Jean Houston said when she heard that mm -hmm. I had developed these names, yes. ah, Linda is bringing the spirit of the animals mm -hmm. into the work. Yes. And I hadn't, I didn't get that. I hadn't gotten that until I heard her mm -hmm. comment about that. And, mm -hmm. and she had, that had a big effect. Of course I am. Wow, isn't that fascinating? Because in those days, I was still thinking much more logically. And now, whenever I start a workshop, and what I did before we started our talk was call in, just imagine calling in the spirit of all the animals now. Mm -hmm. All of the animals who have graced my life, all of the animals who need just support and recognition. Mm -hmm. And anybody can do that and just, you know, work way beyond just us sitting here. Now, you've worked, I'm sure, with thousands of animals at this I point. I have, yes. Yeah. But more important to me than what I've worked with is that through my books and all of our teachers, mm -hmm. many, many, many other people have worked with many animals. Yeah. And recognize, for me, it's about recognizing the beauty, the joy that animals bring to our lives, how important they are in mm -hmm. our lives. Mm -hmm. Well, this is very profound, and uh, I certainly have the sense speaking to you that uh, these spirits are with you, and not just with you, but with us. And, with us. Yeah. With us. With and and I would uh, I assume that our viewers will actually be experiencing this same sense of communion, communion with life. With life, and I'd like to actually after that first definition of intuition, mm -hmm. that simple unlearned knowledge. Somebody gave me a book, and in the book was a different definition of intuition that I believe fits. And intuition is the manifestation of divine consciousness within you. Mm -hmm. Knowing and understanding its truth can change your life and help you find your true path. Beautiful. That is beautiful, and I think that is a, a good note to conclude this conversation on Linda Tellington Jones. What a joy to be with thank you. Thank you. It's my great pleasure. Thank you so much, and thank you for being with us.